All right, everyone. A very warm welcome again. I hope uh, everyone can can hear me very well. If you can just uh, feed the chat box, so that we can. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Yokim. All right. I hope everyone had a great experience yesterday and gained invaluable insight from the session. Let's kick off the first morning session of the conference day two. For this, we have in our first session, Mr. Soon Yu. Uh, Mr. Soon Yu is an international speaker and author on innovation and design. He most recently served as a global VP of innovation at VF Corporation USA. His best selling book, Iconic Advantage, challenges businesses to focus their innovation priorities on building greater iconicity. He's highly sought after speaker on innovation and has been featured in WSJ, Washington Post and New York Times. May I now please invite Mr. Yu to take this conversation ahead. Mr. Yu, please. Thank you, Hassan. Um, Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, evening where I'm at. I'm in California and I'm very excited to be connected to everybody. I know it's morning for you and I'm very excited to be kicking off the session uh, today. Um, let me go ahead and uh, see if I can get the share screen to work. So, as I mentioned, uh, the goal for discussion today is actually, you know, what goes into creating iconic brands and how do the idea of the moments in the brand experience um, relate to creating something that is timeless and something that becomes relevant and meaningful uh, to people. So, um, what I really wanted to share is a lot of my experiences working at VF Corp. Um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with VF. A lot of brands, over 30 brands under management, was working there. And asked the actually trying to get to commercialize $2 billion. And so a lot of what I'm gonna to share today is some of the lessons learned and also some of the pursuit of trying to figure out best practices uh, to you know, be better at uh, innovation. And in fact, I just want to, the, the level set with you how bad of a failure I was, uh, especially in my career, I have a personal scorecard of failure. Um, just wanted to share with you that I've had four career restarts that's a euphemism or a better way of saying that I got fired from my job and I was out for six to 12 months looking for another job four times. OK, so I did something wrong, at least in four of my uh, different jobs. Um, I've also started five businesses that unfortunately never saw the late, uh, never saw the day of light. And and so uh, those are businesses where uh, I had to see them dissolve. But in the process of doing that, uh, the hardest thing is actually um, hiring people that I really cared about, that shared a vision with me, and um, having to tell them, look, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to afford the payroll in the next few months, and, and conducting those layoffs, and those were tough. And in my career, unfortunately, I've had well over 30 product failures. So um, for those of you who have ever had any, uh, I, I think, uh, experience in innovation, you probably understand that this comes with the territory. Lastly, this is more of a US-based number, but uh, this was my credit score. Most uh, credit scores in the US are around uh, 700 to 800. Uh, 300 is the lowest you can get. And in my life, I got it twice, okay? So just so you understand, uh, the idea of failing was very big and it was a very big motivator to kind of figure out why are all these other businesses, all these really successful businesses like BMW, like Nike, like Amazon, like Google, how are they doing innovation differently than what I had done? And that led me to write the book, Iconic Advantage, really looking at what creates brands that stand the test of time. And so that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. Um, first, I wanna just begin with a very simple business con uh, concept that Michael Porter shared many, many years ago. And Michael Porter is this, uh, well-known strategist, and he basically says most businesses try to pursue two generic strategies. One is either you're the cost leader or you focus on providing differentiation and obviously realizing greater uh, value and higher prices 
through differentiation. And most people, given limited resources, can produce or, or can only pursue one or the other. Now, back about 10 years ago when I was at VF, we were looking at our business model. And what we were facing was very interesting. Again, this was 10 years ago. First and foremost, there was the advent of all this new fast fashion, you know, the Uniqlo's, the, um, the, 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 the um, um, H&Ms of the world were coming out. And not only were they able to produce the same coat or shirt or tie or, or shoes that we were uh, for a third of the price, they could actually deliver it in two to three weeks when, as many of you in manufacturing understand this, oftentimes it took our a cycle a year or two to actually get it onto a retail floor. So that was something that we were being out innovated on, not just on cost, but on speed. On top of that, when you're thinking about differentiation, I shared this 10 years ago with the board of directors at VF Corp. And I asked the board members, can you at least name one row? Play tic-tac-toe here and see if you can name at least one row. And believe it or not, nobody in the room could actually name one row. And so this was just more of an illustration of the pace of change of business models. So not only were we being dif out differentiated in terms of product innovation, but we were also being out innovated in terms of business model innovation. So we were being out innovating on cost innovation and then on business model and differentiation. So what do we do with that? Well, typically big corporations like VF, we hire very expensive consultants and they typically say, look, hey, there's one or two things you need to do. You need to be a game changer. You need to get on that next S curve. You need to innovate or die. I'm sure you've heard these um, sort of uh, token uh, catchphrases many times. And of course, me, my job being in charge of innovation, uh, that's what we tried to do. Now, here's the issue. This is an uh, illustration of the Boston Consulting Group's growth share matrix. And in the growth share matrix, it talks about how you actually manage your portfolio. And what they talk about is the goal is you have certain parts of the business that generate a disproportionate amount of the income and of the profit and of the revenue. And you take those parts of it and you use them to fund the shiny innovation stars that you have. And that is the conventional wisdom in terms of portfolio management. And that's what we had been doing. Well, when I investigated all these companies that were building timeless brands, they were actually doing something quite different. Instead of innovating the new, they were actually innovating the old. And in fact, what they did is they took a lot of those cash cows and they milked them to create and, and, and use that milk to butter them up to create iconic franchises. Instead of chasing the new, they were innovating what they were already strong at, what they were already good at, what they were already known for, where they already had market momentum and market acceptance and supply chain experience. Makes all the sense in the world. So it's not that you don't go after shiny new objects or shiny new ideas. It's where you apply them. Instead of applying them into new spaces, new business models, new market segments, new product lines, Take those shiny new ideas and apply it against where you already have existing market momentum, existing brand potential. So that's what these companies did. Because if you think about it, if you're always innovating around the idea of new ideas and shiny new objects, you're probably in this quadrant where your chance of success isn't that great and your cost effectiveness is quite low. But if you take those new ideas and apply it against where you already have distribution, where you already have supply chain know-how and capabilities and logistics to support that, where you already have consumers that love you and are queuing up to buy the latest and greatest of the, the, the franchise that they've already come to know, you will more likely be in this quadrant. And that's what these companies learn, and that's what I learned from researching them. You know, if you pursue this model, you actually end up having greater cost leadership because if you have a franchise, a product line, a brand, a part of the business, that is your cash cow. Generally speaking, you probably have a higher share in the marketplace, and therefore you're going to have greater economies of scale. And by continuing to invest in areas where you already have, you know, uh, production lines built, where you already have die cast models of the whatever shoe or product that you've built um, already created, where you already have know-how people 
already situated to deliver this, by doubling down, increasing the volume there, you're going to increase your cost leadership. By taking your shiny new ideas and innovating where you're already strong, you also get differentiation. So whereas Michael Porter said you can't do both, in this scenario, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can end up being both a cost leader and the differentiator leader. That's what's so exciting about investing and innovating the old. Now, what, now when we think about differentiation, it's not just any kind of differentiation. It's differentiation that's meaningful, that's differentiated in a way that touches you. Imagine having a pair of these during your first job interview, and they were handed down to your, from your, your grandmother to your mother and your mother to you. And although you may never pull it out in your job interview to take down any notes, knowing that you have it in your pocket or your purse or, or in, in your briefcase or wherever you're, you're carrying or your backpack gives you a quiet boost of confidence just because of the meaning attached to this iconic product. You know, it applies to obviously shoes, right? When you think about it, these are both leather shoes, but they have very different brand personas and they make you feel very differently when you wear it. So I went to Tory Burch and I asked him, hey, are you guys a Birkenstock or a Birch, right? Are you a Burke or a Birch? And I was assuming they'd all say, hey, we're all Birches. And they said, no, it depends. It depends on where I'm at, who I'm with, what I'm doing, and what I'm feeling. So if I am in New York, which Tory Burch was at, and they're wanting to go on a Sunday brunch with their girlfriends and walk down Fifth Avenue, they would definitely be wearing their Birches. But if they were instead in New York, obviously, New York State, going up to the Caskill Mountains and having a picnic on a summer you know, uh, morning or eve, they would be wearing their Birkenstocks. And it would make them feel very different about who they are and, 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 and who they are with. And so that's the amazing thing about iconic products. Same thing happens with motorcycles. If we were in Rome and we wanted to explore the ancient ruins, we would probably take a Vespa. But if we wanted to go on the out, you know, in, in, out in the open in, uh, in the U.S. or somewhere around the world or across Europe or, or across India, it would be great to have this loud Harley Davidson because, you know, it's like being a cowboy, right? Both are perfectly forms of two-wheel transportation. But how they make us feel about ourselves when we ride them or when we wear them is very different. And that's because iconic products really go farther than what we see and what we think and what we feel to the higher place of what we believe about ourselves, about the products, and how, how they help us identify with ourselves when we actually use them. The most important thing about this is when we look at profit, those that had iconic branding tend to have anywhere from 2 to 100x more profit than their competitors. That's an important thing. So trying to create that iconic differentiation leads to real value. You know, one of the quotes I really love is what Steve Jobs said to Mark Parker, the newly minted CEO of Nike. And when Mark first ascended at that time, uh, I think uh, John Donnell has taken over since then from Mark. But when Mark first started, this is what Steve said. He said, Nike makes some of the world's best products. And a product that you lost after but you also make a lot of crap. So just get rid of the crappy stuff and focus on the good stuff. And that's what innovating the old is all about. If you've got some great stuff, double down on that. And so that's what Iconic Advantage is all about. So how do we achieve this idea of Iconic Advantage? First thing we need to answer is what makes something iconic? So when we looked at these 50 companies and we did the research, we found some patterns. We found that there are three qualities that all these products focus on. First and foremost, all these iconic franchises had something unique, differentiated, distinct about them versus the competition. It made them stand out versus that competition. Whatever that distinction is, the second quality that they all possessed was that distinction, that uniqueness was highly relevant to the people they wanted to become iconic to. Now, what's important is that this relevance wasn't just today. It wasn't in the past. It was also in the future. It's what I talked about being timeless. It was timelessly relevant. So that distinction was meaningful throughout the entire arc. And lastly, they were universally recognized for that distinctive relevance over time. 
And by universally being, uh, by being universally recognized by the audience you want to become a connect to, and having the longevity, then you're more likely to become the standard bearer for that distinctive relevance and thereby become iconic for. And that's it. So these are the three qualities. Knowing that these are the three qualities, these are really the three things we say in terms of best practices that you focus on to supercharge these three qualities. So when you look at your brand, your product line, your business, an important question to ask is, do I have great noticing power? Is there the ability to capture and hold attention? Do I have something unique and differentiated that does that? Or do I look like everybody else? Once you have that, do you have staying power? Meaning that whatever that distinction is, are you making it relevant yesterday, today, and tomorrow? And that's all about the idea of timeless relevance. And lastly, are you making sure that people see your distinctive relevance, whether it be in your marketing, whether it be in your distribution, you know, wherever they might see it, are you having it show up? Okay, those are the three qualities. What I really want to focus in on today is this idea of creating great distinction and noticing power. So let me share the story. In the 1950s, there was uh, the space sort of um, a race between the US and Russia, and they all tried to get to the moon. And there was a uh, NASA engineer by the name of M. Frank Rudy. And his job was to figure out how to create how to protect the head of the astronaut. And he had a couple constraints. He didn't, he wasn't allowed to add too much weight because the uh, spacesuits were already, already very heavy and not too much bulk because they were already pretty awkward to maneuver. So he had to figure out a way to protect the helmet and protect the head from trauma. And so what he did is he came up with these air pockets that surrounded the head because they were light and they were easy to um, uh, install. And he thought to himself, if they work so well up there on your head, how might they actually work down there for your feet? And he ran around and sold this idea to many, many companies. And almost everybody turned him down except for one company, which I'm sure you guys already know. But he basically licensed his technology to Nike. And in the 1970s, Nike came up with the tailwind. Now, the issue with the tailwind is we go back to the idea of you have something that captures people's attention. But when you look at this, this doesn't have great noticing power for that benefit or the feature associated with the benefit. In fact, when they launched this, it wasn't very successful. The only way people knew that there was any unique innovation or technology in here was by reading the hang tag or looking at the point of sale. And for most people, it felt really gimmicky. So they took it off. When they launched this, it wasn't very successful. The only way people knew that there was any unique innovation or technology in here was by reading the hang tag or looking at the point of sale. And for most people, it felt really gimmicky. So they took it off the shelf. They brought it back to the Nike kitchen. And Tinker Hatfield, who was the head of the kitchen at that time, basically told his designers two pieces of advice. One is, help me make this unique, distinctive feature and the benefit associated with this feature immediately and visibly obvious, number one. Number two, make it look sexy, make it look cool. Of course, the, the, the last one is a pretty important one because that always motivates your designers, right? So this is obviously what they came out with. And then in 1987, they launched the Air Max. And for those of you old enough like me to be around when it actually showed up in the shelves, it was not only that it looked very different than the tailwind, okay, because of the uh, air pocket and the bubble right there, but the way they displayed it, they actually put a light behind the shoe so that when you walked by, you saw these rays of light emanating from the bottom of the shoe, and it was quite unique. And of course, you'd want to pick it up and squeeze in and push it. Uh, I remember even poking at it, seeing if it would off gas. And this was brilliant. You see, this was great noticing power. It immediately drew your attention to an important feature and communicated the benefit of that feature. Most trainers lose 40% of their support in their lifetime, but a pocket of air never loses its balance. So that's what was really important and critical about creating great noticing power. And 
So when you think about creating noticing power and this idea of creating great distinction, one analogy to think about is how do legal entities tell us apart? So in the US, it's very important that you have a social security number, you might even have your fingerprint, but for most people, believe it or not, the way that lawyers and banks are able to tell us apart, and even in, in our elections, is through our signature. So the question I ask everybody is for the business, for the product, even for your own personal professional career, what's your signature? What makes you known and stand out versus other people? What is it that you have a superpower that people know about you? And if you don't have a signature, then you don't have great noticing power and you'll never become iconic because you're never going to be known uh, for some distinctive relevance um, and, and get credit for it. So what are some ways to create great signatures? Well, okay. So obviously par for the course is the idea of having a great name and logo. We know a lot of people that have those. That's fine. Okay, that's a good start, but that's not enough. We talked about this idea of having a feature, a product feature, some part of you know, the service or the product itself where people know you specifically for that. Another way is through style and color. When people see this pattern, this, this sort of a, a checkered pattern, it sort of signifies to them classic English elegance that Burberry brings to bear. What about the idea of a silhouette? Um, Corona beers are basically naked without that line. The line really is the embodiment of the idea that we are the vacation beer. We are the beer that takes you to the beach. You could be in the cold of the Swiss Alps or somewhere else in Antarctica and break out a Corona Extra and put the lime in it and it will flash you back and sort of give you this idea that you are having a mini vacation while you're having the beer. And that silhouette of having a lime in the neck, that's Corona signature. And if you want to combine silhouette with color, there's many other ways to create iconic signatures, the very famous Tiffany ring box. What else can you do? What about the idea of sensory? When you hear that, what do you think of? So that's an auditory sensory. There's also taste sensory. There's also smell sensory. But you think of Intel inside. I'll give you guys one more. Skype, no one uses that anymore, but still, Skype. So there are different ways from a sensorial point of view to also own signatures. Um, how about this? Have you ever purchased something that was heavily packaged with plastic and you had to take it home and take your scissors and cut it open and even then you still had to rip it open and it was still very painful, okay? That's not a good signature to have. Well, there's another company that thought about the idea of unveiling a treasure, that my products were so precious that it's more about unboxing a treasure, Apple. I don't know if any of you have ever owned Apple products, but when I ask people that own Apple products, they not only keep the products, they keep the packaging. Um, like nine out of 10 people that have bought an Apple product have kept the actual packaging and never used it ever again. They just kept it because it was such a beautiful experience, all right? And that is actually one of their key signatures is the unveiling of an Apple. Range Rover, really well known or, or the Land Rover is really well known for their uh, luxury. But what people didn't realize is that they actually have roots in off-roading. And so they have these experience centers where you go out and you take the vehicles off-roading, these four-wheel drive off-roading vehicles, and you take them to the limit in terms of what they can do. And it's an amazing experience that really helps you understand the craftsmanship, the history that actually went into making these cars. Another way is language. What if you end up not only being a noun, but a verb? When you accomplish that and an adjective, if you can accomplish all three, then you have actually reached the status of uh, standing for something and becoming a standard bearer. Also, there's always obviously the idea of points of views and spokespeople. And so when you look at it, another way is uh, Watson. And you guys remember that Watson is the spokesperson for IBM. So there are many different ways to create signature elements. What I do want to emphasize is that of all these ways to create signature elements to help you stand out, the most important is, as we were going to talk about earlier, the idea of experiences 
And inside of those experiences are magic moments that stand out more than others. So I'm going to give you one final example, then I'll close up and just share with you how one uh, uh, hotel actually ended up creating a signature moment. Okay. So if you go to TripAdvisor, they rank all the hotels based on consumer rating. And so if you, if you typed in hotels in Los Angeles, and you can do that right now, actually, you'll see that um, there are 15 hotels in Beverly Hills and 350 in Los Angeles. And so I'm showing you the top two in each. This is a presentation I did for the Dorchester Group because they actually own the Beverly Hills Hotel and um, the, uh, which one is it? I think it's the Peninsula. I think they own those two right there, okay? So of the top four hotels in LA, they actually own two of them. What's really surprising to them is not the Hotel Bel Air, okay? Is the one on the bottom. And you look at how many reviews the one on the bottom has, okay? It's the Magic Castle Hotel. And if you've ever been to LA, <laughs> and in fact, sometimes on TripAdvisor, the Magic Castle Hotel ends up showing up number one uh, versus the Hotel Bel Air of all things. And then people are just shocked. So if you look at the, uh, the Magic Castle, it looks like an apartment building. It literally looks like this. It's, uh, you know, not that big. It has a pool in the middle that's probably very small pool, okay? Can't fit a lot of people. And, and, and it really looks like, um, yeah, an apartment complex, a yellow apartment complex. So why is that the number two hotel in Los Angeles? Well, here's why. They understand who they are catering to and how to be iconic to that audience. They aren't going after the Hollywood elite or celebrities. Their main focus is on families. And even inside the idea of families, they focus on one group primarily, and that is the kids. You see, when you go into the room and you go into this hotel, it's specifically catering to the kids. So you open up the closet once you get into your room, and what do you see? You don't just see robes from mom and dad. You see robes for the juniors, right? And in fact, there are thousands of pictures on the TripAdvisor website of kids wearing their robes having a great time. Not only do they have an adult takeout menu or a, a, a room service menu, they actually have one for kids, and it's free. 24-7, they can get any of these items. They actually have a menu for the kids. And in fact, you go into the lobby, and not only do they have a basket of goodies, they have a 24-7 ice cream machine and a soda machine. And so I was thinking, okay, they understand their audience, and they understand that sugar is probably the way to own them. But as I kept reading, reading the views, I found out that this is really secondary to their most signature experience and element for the hotel. It wasn't all this sugar. It, it, it was less about this, and it was all about this picture, which shows up the most in all their reviews. It's the popsicle hotline at the swimming pool. What? Yes, there is a popsicle hotline. And guess what? It is not meant for me or you, mom or dad, no. It is only so high. It's about two and a half feet high, maybe. Yes. You see, it is designed specifically for the kids. The kids, when they're swimming, they're allowed to call this up, order their popsicle, and out comes a man in a suit with a whole bucket of popsicles specifically to the child and offers them their choice of popsicle. And I thought, oh, my God, this is just another extension of having more sugar. But as I read more and more of the reviews, here's what I realized. In the reviews, everyone talked about not just the, the hotline, but it was about the anticipation of the children knowing that they were the only ones who could use the hotline and that they could decide when they wanted to call the hotline, not when their mom and dad said they could, not when anybody else said they could. It's when they they were empowered with the decision of when they wanted to call for the popsicle. And that idea of not only catering to the kids' sweet tooth, but actually empowering them 
with decision rights um, and treating them like adults was their most signature feature of this hotel and has really shot them up into being the top, one of the top hotels in Los Angeles. And that is all by having a signature moment and experience. And so in your creation of brands, think about how to create signature moments. Map the journey experience inside of those journeys. Don't think of every moment as equal. There are probably 10 or 20 moments that matter the most. Try to identify which ones are those. Those disproportionately affect love and hate of the brand. Pick just one of those. Get rid of all the bad fiction in it, okay? Take out all the bad stuff and then infuse a lot of excitement and energy and fun, just like the Popsicle Hotline, and create a signature around one of those moments. And then don't. Like I said, keep innovating. Don't go to the next moment or try to create another signature. Stay with the same signature. Innovate against that and create an innovation pipeline around that moment, one moment and own it forever. And that's how you can create signature moments that then help you become iconic because you have great noticing power. So with that, I uh, want to just pause and uh, open it up to questions. But I hope this was helpful in terms of your journey as you guys build great brands. Um, I know it's, this is more about uh, smart textiles and manufacturing, which I also have a lot of love for. But how might those also help create great signature, signature brands and signature moments? Thank you. So there was a question here. How do you find the right people for innovation in the organization? I think that is a great question. Um, let me do my best to answer that question. Um, um, there's a book written by a famous strategist named uh, Roger Martin. Um, and in that book, he talks about the design of business. And he talks about there's two types of people in an organization. There is the um, reliability part of the organization and the validity part of the organization. And the reliability is exactly what reliability sounds like. It's people that are taking things that are known and making them uh, faster, better, quicker, more reliable, and cheaper, obviously. Um, and that's an important part. That should be 90% of the organization. But then there are folks that are called the, um, the, the validity part of the organization. And those folks are looking for new truths. They're trying to validate unknown or new truths out there. And oftentimes, you know, the validity people say, well, you need to prove it before we'll fund you. And the validity people, well, I, if I don't get the money, I'm never going to be able to prove it. So what you need to do is for your innovation people, you need to have um, a higher index of the validity people, people who want to try new experiments, who are looking for new truths, who have that curiosity, and who are not constrained or, or motivated by the idea of having to take what was known in the past and making it faster, cheaper, or better. So that's the key to hiring great innovation people. The other thing I think is also highly important is it's hard to do innovation on your own these days. They have to have a certain degree of humility and ability to to build and collaborate off people's other people's idea and get excited that their idea is now being changed and being modified. If they're perfectionists and they like to do everything on their own or they have a hard time accepting criticisms or modifications to their ideas, they're probably not the best fit, okay? And then um, I get one last question. How can a manufacturing facility create an iconic brand or signature? The customers are major brands, not consumers directly. So I do get a lot of these type of B2B questions. How do you do B2B? Um, if, if, let's think about your manufacturing facility and what you do, and think about your competitors. They probably do the same thing. Is there something that you do uniquely different that the brands or retailers could actually benefit more from? Is there something that you can be a little bit more nerdy? Is there something that you um, have more knowledge on? Or more access to in terms of you know um, raw materials. Um, is there something where you might actually create a mini innovation center on um, I don't know a certain type of extruded textiles that nobody else in the world has? We're so nerdy now, and maybe only it impacts five percent of the your customers' portfolio. But because you're so good at it, they they will always know you as uh, somebody that's an expert, a thought leader uh, that's pushing the envelope on something that may halo, and, and, and being a nerd about something, being an expert about something, halos you for everything else you do. So just pick one part of your 
supply chain, your approach, your processes, your capabilities, your machinery, your access to the region's materials, experts, pick one, become well known for that. And obviously do everything else well too. And, and so that's how you through, uh, can become iconic with your customers, not just consumers.